Hi, and welcome to lecture zero of the course of particle physics. So this is an introductory lecture, and what I want to discuss with you today are a few basic things uh, that we need to know before really starting into the things. Okay, so the first subject that I'm going to discuss today are the particle and the patches. I'm sure most of you know much of what I'm going to see, but I think it's best to recap the situation just to put everybody on the same Okay. Then we're going to discuss uh, the system of natural units, which is going to be the system of units we're going to use throughout the course. So natural units are the units in which we take each bar to be equal to one and also C to be equal to one. Okay. So you see that there are units which are uh, created to make simple uh, and, uh, relativistic computations because we make C equal to one. Okay. So we're going to have uh, Large effects and effects, the relativistic effects are important. And then we're going to make quantum mechanics simple because each one is equal to one. Okay, as we're going to see to discuss particles, we're going to have to use a tool which is called quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, in its relativistic version, the one that we're going to have to use to properly describe relativistic particles, elementary particles, is going to be a theory which marries quantum mechanics. With uh, relative, especially, okay, we're not going to talk about uh, uh, general relativity in this course. So we're just going to mention gravity today, but we're not going to really enter into the details of the quantization of gravity and its uh, very interesting subjects. The last topic I want to discuss with you is uh, give you an introduction of effective field theory. Okay, so this is the modern viewpoint on particle, on particle physics and more in general on particle. The fact that all our theories are effective theories, so they have a limited range of probability. Methods. Okay, so let's start with the first point. And instead of starting with the particles, let me start with interactions. Okay, so the the pictures that emerges of a force of an interaction from quantum field theory is a picture in which a inter an interaction. Is characterized by two points. The first one is the strength, meaning the coupling. Okay. So this coupling is the analog of the electric charge or of the Newton coupling, the electric charge in the case of electromagnetism, and the Newton coupling in the case of gravity. Okay. And then we have a mediator. So if we think about, for example, the interaction, the Coulomb interaction in the context of quantum theory, as we're going to see, the picture that emerges is the following. We have a particle matter, which scatters all another particle, matter particle, another electron. And what they do in this interaction is they exchange a mediator, which in the case of electromagnetism is going to be the flow. Okay. Now, for all the forces that I'm going to discuss uh, in two minutes, this is the picture that we're going to follow. Okay, so there are going to be matter particles, which I'm going to introduce uh, in 10 minutes. And then there are going to be mediators, which are the guys uh, about which I'm going to discuss now. Okay, so let's write down what are the forces that we know and uh, what are the mediators. So the first force that we know is gravity. Okay, we know that we can study also the classical level, and we do, it's general relativity. Okay, then we have electromagnetism, which is uh, the other interaction that we can study at, uh, at the classical level. Okay, so these two are interactions that, that can manifest themselves, uh, or that manifest themselves also at the classical level. Okay, and this is related to the mass uh, of the then we're gonna we're gonna have forces that uh, are purely quantic, quantical, the purely emerging quantum mechanics. Okay, and uh, this is because the mass of the mediator is uh, is not zero, so it's pretty difficult and it's, uh, it costs a lot of energy to produce these mediators. So we're gonna have the weak force. We're gonna have the strong force. And then the most recently discovered, the Higgs force. So let me put here 
the spin of the mediator, its mass, and its name. Okay. So what is the spin of the particle that mediates gravity? Well, the spin is two. Okay. This is something that uh, uh, we're not really going to handle in the details, but it can be shown that the only consistent theory of, of gravity must have a spin to mediator. The mass is zero, and this is why it costs just a little bit of energy to produce a lot of gravitons, and that's why it can manifest itself as a classical force, okay? Because if you have a classical source, you can create really a, a huge number of gravitons, and this is what we call a classical force. And then it's gravity, as I already mentioned a couple of times. Electromagnetism. Well, electromagnetism is mediated by a spin one particle, again of zero mass. And again, this is the reason why electromagnetism can manifest itself at a classical level. And the name is the photon. Okay. So let me already write here also the symbol that we will use for this particle. So for the gravity, we will use small g. Okay. We won't really use it during the course, but if that's the, the, the notation which is going to be used. For the photon, we will use capital A, exactly as I did uh, in this example of the, of the Coulomb scattering. Okay. Let's move on. Weak interactions. So weak interactions are, uh, uh, are, uh, are stranger okay, than the other forces. So they are mediated by spin one particles. We have three of them. Okay, and these three organize themselves into a charge conjugate pair, which are the W plus or minus bosons. Okay, and a neutral guy, which is called the Z. So the mass of the W plus minus is 80.4 G, while the mass, the mass of the Z guy is 90.1 G. So you see that uh, this is the first time that we encounter massive mediums. Okay, so you see that this mass is not uh, is not small. So it costs a lot of energy to produce uh, these three mediums, and that's why this uh, this force, this weak force, uh, it's a pure quantum effect. Okay, it doesn't really. There is no. You really need to create in a laboratory with an accelerator these guys. Uh, it is not so easy to have a source that produce a lot of these guys. Okay, so that's why it's, uh, it's, they do not manifest themselves uh, at the classical level. So the name, uh, I'm not gonna write there, but the name of this is W boson, and the symbol that we use is W, and the name of this one is Z boson, and the symbol that we use is. Okay. Now, strong interactions. These are also kind of strange. So they're negated by spin one particle, okay. Their mass is zero. So this would make us uh, suppose uh, that by analogy with these two, there should be a classical strong interaction. Actually, this is not really the case because uh, strong interactions at low energy are strong, as the name suggests. Okay. So what happens is that they are used to create bound states of matter particles of a certain kind of matter particles, which are the force. Okay. So they do not have a long range as these two but they have a short range because they are strong, okay? And their effect at low energy, it's, uh, it's exactly the one of creating bound states. These bound states are one we're going to discuss in a while, but they can be either mesons or pi's, okay? These are very, uh, we know very well some examples of these bound states, but the proton, the neutron, are bound states uh, of fermions and they're bound states of three points, okay? The proton is, uh, Two up quarks and one down quark, and the down in the neutron is two down quarks and one up quarks. So the reason why a low energy we can detect uh, protons and neutrons and not free quarks uh, is precisely due to the fact that the strong force is not strong. Okay. <clears throat> then of course quantum effects uh, change uh, the situation at high energy. But we're gonna do this, we're gonna discuss this. Okay. So the name of, of this mediator is gluons. And I'm using here the plural because uh, there are eight of them. Okay, so unlike the graviton, the photon, in the photon, you see that there is one graviton 
there is one photon, there are three mediators of uh, weak forces, and there are eight mediators of the strong force. Okay, we're going to explain why this is. Okay, this is a, a this is a manifestation of the fact that these forces, uh, these interactions, uh, emerge from the so-called non-abelian gauge theories. Okay, but well, we're going to see. Now, finally, the Higgs, this is different because the spin of the Higgs particle of the Higgs mediator is zero. Its mass is 125.5 GB. So its name is Higgs, and the symbol that we're going to use is small h. Okay, so you see that also this one has a pretty large mass, so it's not uh, at, the at the classical level, we cannot excite it. Okay, we cannot excite it. Large number, and so this Higgs force doesn't manifest, doesn't manifest in the classical level. Okay, let me just uh, uh, for completeness say that the Higgs particle was the last particle uh, that was discovered, and it was discovered just a few years ago in 2012. Okay, very good. So now that we discussed the interactions, let's move to matter particles. Okay. So uh, let me cancel here. And let's start with our discussion of matter particles. So matter particles come in two types. Okay, the first type is called leptons. And the other type is called quarks. Both the leptons and the quark each come in two types. Okay, so here we have the charge leptons, and here we have the neutral leptons, which take the name, the name of neutrinos. On the contrary, the quarks can be split as uptight quark and downtight quark. Okay, so let's write the names of these particles. So let me organize this table like this. So the charged electrons are going to be the electron, the mu, and the tau. Okay. The neutrinos are going to be the neutrino of the electron, the neutrino of the mu, and the neutrino of the tau. Okay. So each one of the charged electrons come with its own type of neutrino. Now, what about the after point? Well, we have the, what is called the up quark, the charm quark, and the top quark. Okay, so we're going to use the symbol U for up, C for charm, T for top. And uh, for the down type quarks, we are going to use D for down. Okay, so these were the first one to be postulated and discovered, and that's why they give name to the type of quarks. Then we have the strange quark and the bottom quark. Okay, just a word about this B. So historically, this B meant uh, both bottom and beauty, but the modern name for the B quark is bottom. Okay, so from time to time when you consult old books, uh, you can see this, uh, this particle called the beauty particle, but nowadays we call it uh, bottom. Okay, it doesn't matter, it's just a name. So, you see, I have organized the matter particles in this way because you see that uh, this uh, organization makes clear that uh, we have three different uh, families or generations of particles. Okay, so this uh, is the first generation, this is the second, and this is the third. The quantum numbers of leptons and the secretary of quarks inside each generation are equal, okay? So the E 
and the electron and the neutrino of the electron is exactly, exactly the same quantum numbers as the mu and the neutrino of the mu, and it's exactly the same quantum number as the tau and the neutrino of the tau. Okay. At the same, in the same, exactly the same way, the up quark and the down quark has exactly the same quantum number as the charm and the strange and as the top and the bottom. Okay. What changes as we move across generations is the mass of the particles. Okay. So let me write here what are the quantum numbers. We're going to see in a while. What are the masses? But let me put just the quantum numbers. Okay, so I'm gonna distinguish between electromagnetism, okay, and then I'm gonna put if they interact through gravity, if they interact through strong interactions, and if they interact through weak interactions. Okay, so. The electric charge of the charged leptons is the minus one. Okay. Electric charge of the neutrinos is zero. That's why they are called the neutrinos. Okay. Neutrinos mean, means in Italian small neutron. The electric charge of the uptight quarks is plus two thirds. Okay. And the electric charge of the down quark is minus one third. These numbers are fixed because we define. The charge, the electric charge of the proton to be plus one, and the electric charge of the neutron to be zero. Okay, if you remember, I told you that the proton is up, up, down. So you see that it's two thirds times two minus one third, which gives charge, the electric charge plus one, and the neutron is down, down, up, and you see that in this case the electric charge is cancelled and we give a neutral object. Okay, now what the which among these particles interact via gravity? Well, all of them, okay? So all of this uh, interact via gravity. What about the strong interaction? So here comes the difference, okay? So the leptons are defined as those particles that do not interact through strong interactions, while the quarks are precisely those particles that interact through strong interactions, okay? That's why we have uh, <coughs> bound states of quarks uh, at low energy, like proton and neutron, but we do not have uh, uh, bound states uh, of leptons okay, among each other due to the strong, to the strong interaction, because they simply do not interact with the strong interaction. Now, what about the weak, weak interaction? Well, again, all of them will interact through weak interactions, okay? Like this and like this. Very good. So now that uh, we have uh, a broad overview of uh, of the matter particles. So let's write down their masses, okay? Because in uh, writing down their masses, we make clear the fact that uh, typically the first generation uh, is lighter than the second and it's lighter than the first. Okay, from here you see that uh, all these particles are exactly the same quantum numbers, right? You see they all interact. We're gonna see that actually the charges of this, let I me mean, just uh, this down again because uh, it's really good. Okay, so the situation is this. This is the charge electrons, so these are the neutrinos, these are the after quarks, and these are the downtime quarks. Okay, and you see that all the quantum numbers are the same like this. The only thing that will change is uh, the mass. Okay, so let's see this. So I'm going to cancel here. Because I want to draw the plot of the masses. So let's draw a line here. So this represents the mass of the particle. Okay, so this is the direction of increasing mass of particles. So let me start uh, down here. So this is a scale of one EV, electron volt. And uh, below one EV, we know for that there are going to be the neutrinos. Okay, we don't know exactly what are the masses of the neutrinos, but we know for sure for measurements that they must be smaller than one EV. So here we have new E, new mu, and new tau. Okay, 
There are some subtleties about uh, the fact that actually new in, new, new and new tau do not have well-defined well -defined mass. Actually, we need to take uh, uh, linear combinations of them. But uh, if we have time, we get back to the question of the masses uh, towards the end of the course. Okay. So here we have a, we are at the scale of one unit. Then we move up. There is a desert, so there are no particles until the scale of one MeV. Okay, and slightly below the scale of one MeV, the first particle appears, which is the electron. Okay, so here we have the electron which with a mass of 0 0.5 MeV. Okay, this is the first one that appears. Now. Slightly above one MeV, two more particles appear, which are the up quark with a mass of two to three MeV, and the down quark with a mass of four to six MeV. Okay. So you see that here there is no well defined mass simply because, as I was mentioning, these particles appear purely in bound states generated by the spawning formation. Okay. So it's very difficult to pinpoint their mass. Okay, they do not, this up and down do not exist as free particles, so it's very difficult to measure their mass. Okay. For heavier quarks, the situation is a bit uh, easier because these heavier quarks uh, decay quickly. But for this, it's a more. Okay. So you see that apart from the neutrinos, which are down here, so they have a mass which is much lighter than all the other particles, these are precisely the particles uh, of the first generation. Okay. It's, a, it's still a mystery. We still do not have uh, a, a consensus on why the neutrinos uh, is, are so light, but this is something that uh, we measure experimentally. Okay, so we accept that they are down here. Okay. As we're going to see in the theory that we will uh, construct, describe particles, which is called the standard model of particle physics, neutrinos will come out uh, completely massless. Okay, so that's, that's because we do not have uh, a well-defined or confirmed mechanism to produce neutrino masses. And that's why generating neutrino masses is usually considered something that goes beyond the standard model of particle physics. Okay. And the reason is because of the neutrinos are down. Now, these are the particles of the first generation. Now, as we move up in mass, the particles of the second generation will start to appear. Okay. So the first one is the strange quark which has a mass of 95 MeV. Then immediately above, the new lepton appear, appears with a mass of 100 MeV. Okay. And now we cross the GeV scale and the charm quark appear here with a mass of 1.4. G. Okay, so you see that there are differences between the masses, but uh, these are uh, the particles of the second generation. Okay, so neutrinos down here, first generation, second generation. Now, as we move up in mass, uh, the particles of the third generation will appear. Okay, so the first one is the tau quark, sorry, the tau lepton with a mass of 1.7 GV. Then there is the bottom quark with a mass of 4.5. GV, and then we go up, 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 until we get to 173 GV, and this is the mass of the top. Okay, so you see that uh, the top work is uh, special in a sense because it's the heaviest of the top. Okay, and as we are going to see, this the mass of this top work uh, is uh, basically the same mass scale uh, as. Uh, the one associated with the emergence of weak interactions. Okay, so there may be something behind behind this fact, although we don't know what it is. Okay, maybe that there is, that this doesn't mean anything. It may be that actually this is pointing towards a special rule of the top. Okay, we're not going to bother and we're not going to worry about these problems because in this course we're going to introduce the model of particle physics, the standard model. But keep in mind that uh, the fact that the top work is up here may mean something. Okay. And these are the quarks uh, of the, the particles of the third generation. Okay. Now, if you want to know more about these particles, uh, have a look uh, 
at the website of the particle data group, okay, PDG. There are a lot of reviews and all the properties of the particle, the decays and the masses and all their properties are listed in this website. Okay, this is kind of the Bible for the particle physics. So I really suggest that you have a look at this. Now, before moving, uh, before moving on to other, uh, to the other points uh, of the lecture, let me just stress uh, three more points. Okay, three things which we really need to keep. So the first one is that uh, at uh, low energy, strong interactions are strong. Okay, as their name suggests, uh, they are really uh, they are really strong. By strong, I mean that they are non perturbative. Okay, so the perturbative techniques that we usually use in quantum field theory they completely fail in the case of strong uh, interactions and low energy. Okay, and the physical manifestation of which this uh, is that the bound states uh, emerge, the bound states uh, of the particles that interact through strong interaction, which are quarks. Okay, so low energy we just measure we cannot measure free quarks, but we just measure bound states of quarks, okay? Now, of which quarks? Of the quarks which are below the scale of 1 GV, because the scale of 1 GV is the scale that represents uh, the strong interactions become strong, okay? As we're gonna see in, a, in quantum mechanics, in a quantum theory, the coupling of the forces depends, uh, depends on the energy, okay? Which uh, we are measuring in our process. So if we measure strong interactions up here, at the scale which is around the top mass of the bottom, strong interactions are actually not so strong. They're pretty weak, okay? So they are, they are not, they are perturbative. They are not more perturbative. If we measure processes down here at the scale of GV or below, then they're non perturbative. And so it's this course here that actually form bound states uh, of uh, generating this non interaction, okay? So the bound states are called mesons, and they are called volumes. So the mesons are bound states of type quark, anti-quark, okay? And examples of these are the pions, so the pi zero, pi plus minus, the kaons, which come in four types, k zero, anti k zero, k plus, k minus, the rho, the omega, and so on. Okay, we're gonna, we're going to describe all these uh, all these objects uh, in a couple of lectures. We discuss quantum What about the pions? Well, the pions are bound states of three quarks. Okay, and uh, as an example of these values, we already know the proton, the neutron, that is the delta particle, and so on and so forth. Okay, so just for you to have in mind that this is uh, one of one of the important things that we must keep in mind. Now. Another important point that I want to stress is what are, uh, let, let's ask ourselves the following question. So in general, as we're gonna see, these particles will decay into the other particles, okay? So for instance, the top will decay into the bottom quark and will emit a W quark, okay? This is one of the things that we're going to construct during this course. So let me stress now, what are the stable particles that we have, okay? So, as far as we know, neutrinos are stable. So let me underline the stable particles. So as far as we know, neutrinos are the lightest particle, the lightest massive particle, okay? And the lightest among the, among the neutrinos for sure is stable because there is nothing else in which it can be okay? The electron is stable. The electron is stable because it is the lightest particle which has an electric charge. An electric charge, as we know from classical electromagnetism, is conserved, okay? So if the electron is, is the lightest particle with a mass and it tries to decay into something else, since electric charge is conserved, it would like to, de to decay into something which has an electric charge, and that is not, okay? So the electron is stable, as far as we know. The proton is stable. The stability of the proton is related to some uh, other symmetries, okay, we're going to see that symmetries are going, to, are going to play a very important role in what we're going to say. So there are 
two quantum numbers associated with symmetries. One quantum number is called the baryon number, which is associated with quarks or with baryons. And the other quantum number is called lepton number, and it's associated with leptons. And the conservation of these two quantum numbers generate uh, the stability of the okay. And then, of course, the massless particles are, uh, are stable. Okay, so there are no metal particles which are massless, but we know that there are mediators that are massless. So the graviton is stable. The glues are stable, and the photons is stable. Okay, simply because uh, they are massless. So if they're massless, there is nothing else uh, with a smaller mass in which they can be. Okay. Very good. So the last point that I want to stress before moving to, to natural units is, uh, is the following fact. Okay, so the standard model, you know, the theory that we're going to construct of the model, uh, is a very, very, very successful thing. Okay, as far as we know, there are uh, in the, in the when we compare the prediction of the standard model with data, there are just a few glitches uh, here and there that appear. But statistically, overall, the success of the standard model is really impressive. Okay? Standard model can predict uh, observables uh, with a level of precision which is uh, absolutely confirmed by experiments. So the standard model is a huge success as a model. Okay? Still, there are things that the standard model cannot explain. Okay, so let me make here a list of what we don't know yet. If there is time, uh, maybe I will give uh, a lecture about this uh, at the end of the course. Otherwise, I will give you some references to read uh, if, uh, if you're interested. So, what is that the standard model cannot still explain? Okay, well, one thing is neutrino masses, as I told you. So neutrino, these neutrinos will be strictly massless in the standard model. And uh, the way that we the neutrino masses are generated is still at instant. Okay? There are, of course, a huge amount of models, but we don't know which one is the true, the true one. Okay? So this, uh, this is something that the standard model can explain. Dark matter. We observe dark matter at the cosmological level, and there is no candidate for dark matter in the standard model. Okay? The only candidate would be the neutrinos, which are neutral. But they do not work, okay? Because uh, their mass, you remember, they are very light. And whenever uh, neutral particles are very light, uh, they cannot be Okay, in general, there are exceptions. But as a rule of thumb, uh, you can imagine that very, very light uh, particles interacting through interaction with all the order of the weak interactions cannot be Okay, the metric. Dark energy. You know that the dark energy constitutes roughly the 70% of the energy budget of the universe, and we do not have a candidate for dark energy. We don't know what it is. Okay. Another thing that the standard model doesn't explain is the so called matter antimatter asymmetry. Okay. At the cosmological, again, at the cosmological level, we measure much more matter than antimatter. Okay. Based on the standard model, we would expect roughly the same amount of the two, while we actually measure an asymmetry. And we don't know how this asymmetry is generated. Okay. There are models that connect this metal and metal asymmetry with the generation of neutrino masses. These are called CISO models. Okay, so the masses of <coughs> neutrino, neutrinos are generated at the mass case much above the mass of the top quark. And there is a process which is called leptogenesis, which generate metal and but we do not have any experimental confirmation of this, of this mechanism. So we don't know if that's uh, what happens in each other. Okay. And then there are a couple of questions which are a bit different. Okay, so these are all things that we measure experimentally and the standard model cannot explain. There are also some questions about the internal consistency, uh, not the internal consistency, about uh, some uh, aesthetic feature of the standard model, okay, which are still not uh, really well understood. So the first one is why charge is quantized. 
we measure the charges from tides. Okay, it's pretty amazing that uh, the electric charge of the proton is exactly equal to the to minus the electric charge of the neutron of the electron. Okay, we don't know why this is so. It seems the equality is so perfect that we would suspect that there is some principle behind it, but we still can we still do not know why that is. Okay. And another thing that we do not understand is why the Higgs boson is so light. I told you that the Higgs boson is not particularly light, okay? But uh, what I mean by H is so light is something which is related to the idea of effective field theories that we will introduce uh, in a few minutes. Whenever you have a scalar, remember that the H has a spin zero, so whenever you have a scalar, you would expect this mass to be of the order of the maximum energy at which the theory is valid. Of course, the maximum energy at which the standard model is valid is not 125 GV, because we know that this is the top quark above the mass of 173 GV, and the standard model is valid. Okay? So the maximum energy of the standard model cannot be of the order of the mass of the Higgs. So why is the Higgs so light, and what is stabilizing its mass? This is one of the greatest mystery of particle physics that we still do not know how to solve, okay? There were many, uh, many proposals over the last 40 years, for example, supersymmetric theories, uh, theories with the, in which the Higgs uh, emerges very much uh, like a meson, so as a composite state, but the LHC, the, the model accelerator, didn't measure anything, so it may be that this question is somehow imposed, okay? Maybe that it's not really, a problem, but we don't know why. If it's, if it's not a problem, we don't know why it is not a problem. Okay, so this is one of the tasks. So these are the things that I want you to keep in mind that cannot be explained by the standard model yet. Okay, hopefully in the future we will be able to see something about this, but for the moment, uh, this is where research is focusing on doing things. Very good. So now that we listed all these properties of the particles. Let me quickly discuss uh, natural units, and then uh, I will move to the introduction of uh, effective theories, uh, and we will close uh, this introduction lecture, okay? So natural units. <coughs> So as I told you, natural units means that we're going to take h bar equal to one and also c equal to one, okay? So we take two dimensional two quantities and we impose that they are a dimensional and equal to one, okay? So what does this mean? Well, you see from here, you remember the c as dimensional velocity, okay? So it's length over time. So if it must be equal to one, then this means that the dimension of length must be equal to dimension of time. Otherwise, uh, this relation could not be true, okay? And a similar thing will happen uh, at the level of each bar, okay? Remember that each bar has dimension of an action, okay? Remember that historically, this is called the, quant the action quantum, okay? In an action, if you remember from mechanics, has dimension of an energy times time, okay? So for this to be dimensionless, it means that uh, energy, must be equivalent to time, to the minus one, right? Very good, so just looking at this relation, we know that actually we can express energy as one over length, as one over time. So actually what we're gonna do is to trade one over time for energy. So we will, uh, we will uh, um, describe inverse uh, durations with energy, okay? And we're also going to describe inverse length with energy, okay? Now, they, as, a, as, already, as you already saw in, the, in, in what came before, the unit of energy that we are going to use, and this is something that we will always use, is electron volt, okay? So one electron volt, if you remember, is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joule, okay? So this is gonna be the typical uh, energy scale, energy unit uh, that we're gonna use, okay? And uh, let me just uh, stress once more before concluding this very small interlude 
the dimensional analysis uh, is going to be one of the most important tools uh, that we're going to use in this course. Okay, and uh, I'm going to actually show you at a certain point that there is a symmetry which is associated with uh, dimensional analysis, which are called dilation, dilatations. Okay, and uh, dimensional analysis is simply the selection rule associated with the dilatations. Okay, so keep in mind this uh, and keep in mind uh, the system of natural units. This is going to be really, really important. Very good. So, having done this, let's move to a brief introduction about the effect. Okay. So, EFT stands for effective field theory. As I told you, the tool and the language that we will use throughout the course is the language of quantum field theory. Okay. I'm gonna. Uh, we're going to dedicate, uh, we're going to devote some lectures to, introduce, to the introduction of quantum field theory to explain how it works in a relativistic constant context uh, and so on. Okay. The idea of effective field theory is very simple. Think about the following thing. It's true, okay, I, I claim that it is true that uh, all theories of physics have a limited range of validity. Okay, this is what allows us uh, to actually make physics. To study classical physics, we didn't have to know about quantum mechanics, which happen at uh, length scales which are much smaller. Okay, right? Or we didn't have to know special relativity, which is something that happens to velocities which are much higher. Right? So every theory that we know in physics have limited range of energy. Quantum field theories are not an exception. Okay. And also quantum field theories, we expect them to have a limited range of validity. Since we are going to use natural units, the natural uh, range of validity is expressed in terms of energy. Okay. So what is the picture of a quantum field theory that emerges? Well, if I draw here energies, I know that my quantum field theory, which in the case uh, under consideration will be the standard model, will be valid all the way up to a certain maximum energy, okay, which I'm going to denote by capital lambda. And this is called the cutoff of the theory. Okay. So down here, this is the range of validity of our quantum field theory. Okay. In the case that we're going to discuss uh, the standard model. So, if you remember, to a maximum energy cutoff must correspond an inverse length. Okay. So, since it is inverse, this also corresponds to one over L mi. Okay. There is a minimum length, a minimal, a minimal distance up to which. Uh, the theory is valid. Okay, so the, the theory is valid for all the lengths which are larger. This is the L mean. And when we try to measure something which is smaller than L mean, then our theory fails. Okay, so what we're actually doing is a long distance, uh, is, is equivalent to a long distance measure. Okay, and I'm going to show you in two minutes that this is exactly the analog of what we do in classical physics all the time. Okay, just bear with me one more minute because I want to say that, of course. Once we see that, uh, once we, we, we interpret our quantum field theory as a theory, which uh, as a, a cutoff, of course, the natural question is, okay, what comes above the cutoff? So what, uh, what should replace our quantum field theory? Well, that's the point that we do not know, right? I mean, that's, uh, uh, the idea is that uh, if we are doing measurements at energies, which are much less than lambda, then we do not really need to know what happens above the cutoff. Okay, it's just when we do measurements with energy which start to approach lambda that uh, we're gonna need to know what happens up here. Okay, so in principle, what can happen are well, what we can argue that can happen is that maybe there is another quantum field theory here, a different one with new degrees of freedom of freedom. Maybe there is something completely different, maybe there is string theory or theories of quantum gravity that we still do not have. We still didn't discover, okay? Maybe there is something which is completely 
out of our products yet. And there are something new, something that still wasn't discovered that can replace uh, our theory up here, okay? The point is that to do physics here at the scale of the standard model, we do not really need to know what happens up here. I do not want to say that this uh, doesn't have an impact on measurements, okay? Because as the energy goes up, then we expect the effects of the physics which, which lives up here to start to play a role, okay? But if the energy is sufficiently low, then uh, this, this effect should be sufficiently small that we can actually disregard, okay? And this is actually the, this is actually something that uh, happens all the time also in classified physics. So let me give you a trivial example, okay? That I'm pretty sure you all know very well. So let's take uh, a charge distribution. Static, okay, just, uh, just static. There is nothing strange going on. So this is a static distribution of total charge, which I'm going to call Q0. And the typical size of this object is I'm going to call it A, okay? And suppose now I want to measure or write down the scalar potential at a distance capital R, okay? So I want to know the scalar potential here. Well, we know very well how to write this color potential, right? There is a first term, since there is a large separation of scales, as long as this distance is much larger than the typical size of the object, we can use the multiple decomposition. And so this, uh, this scalar potential, this electrostatic potential, is equal to Q0 divided by capital R, the total electric charge divided by distance. And then there are gonna be additional terms. So the first one is the dipole, which has this form here. Then there is the quadrupole, which you know is a tensor, right? And then there are higher order multiples, okay, that I won't bother to write down. So you see that, uh, so let, let me just remind you that these, uh, these coefficients, uh, so the electric charge, the monopole, uh, the, sorry, the electric charge, the dipole, the quadrupole, and so on, depend uh, as a, a dependence on the size of the object, right? So you know that Q0 doesn't depend because on the size of the object because it's just the total electric charge. Q1 depends linearly, Q2 depends quadratically, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you see that this uh, this uh, this number here, Q sub zero, Q sub one, Q sub two, this number zero, one, two, is actually the power at which uh, <clears throat> the typical size of the object uh, is emerging, okay? So you see that uh, this is something that goes like one over R. This is something that goes like A divided by R, one over R, right? The power of R is canceled down, is canceling this one here. So I'm left with one of R squared and I organize it like this. There is this ratio, which is dimensionless, small, right? This one is much smaller than one. And then there is the distance. And uh, analogously, this one is A over R squared one over R, okay? So you see the way we consider the long distance physics, okay? So where we are very, very, very far away from our static, from our charge distribution, this term is much smaller than this one, and this one is much smaller than this, okay? So only the first term actually matters, so only the monopole. So here you see that only Q0 over R is relevant. Now suppose that we start doing measurements of this static potential at uh, distances which are becoming smaller and smaller, okay? So this uh, ratio, A over R, is becoming larger and larger. So when this happens, okay, so when R is diminishing, it's clear that this still matters, but then also the higher multiples start to matter, right? So at a certain point, uh, we will start to measure also the Q1, the dipole, at even smaller, distances we are starting to measure also the quadruple and so on and so forth, okay? So as the distance is becoming smaller and smaller, in other words, as we are approximating ourselves 
of the object, what happens is that I need to consider more and more terms in this multiple expansion, right? Of course, this expansion completely breaks down when uh, the distance uh, is of the order of A. Okay, in this case, I cannot use the multiple expansion. There is no small parameter over which I can expand. And I need to really compute uh, the full form uh, of the scalar potential, okay? In particle physics, the quantum field theory is exactly the same idea. This R is uh, playing the role of energy, okay? And this A0 is playing the role uh, of the cutoff, the R of inverse energy and A of inverse of the cutoff, okay? So you see that this uh, idea of uh, going closer and closer to the object, so going to smaller and smaller distances, in quantum field theory precisely correspond to going higher and higher in energy, okay? So exactly as we saw that, as R is becoming more and more similar to A, I need to consider more and more terms here. The same thing will happen in quantum field theory. Okay, so we will start with the, what are called operators of dimension four, which are valid at very low energy. But as we move up in energy, we're gonna to have to consider operators of higher dimension, dimension five, six, seven, eight, and so on, which are completely analog of these terms uh, in terms of multiples, of multiples, okay? Of course, when in our quantum field theory we get to the cutoff, we need to change our description and something else will emerge. And that's what we do normally. Okay. We can't know until we are able to devise, uh, to think about experiments uh, that can happen at these energies. Okay. Let me just also um, show you one thing, which is one important thing about symmetries. Okay. Because you see, let's uh, have a look uh, at this table. So when we are very, 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 very far away from the object and only the monopole matters, you see that here, there is a well-defined symmetry under rotations, right? This is uh, the, fact that the, 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 the commonly uh, described fact that uh, when, you, when you are very, very far away from an object, this point, this object looks like a point. And so you can rotate uh, as you want uh, and the physics will remain the same, okay? That's, uh, this is the mathematical statement uh, of this fact. So when only the monopole matters, you see that the only dependence on the distance is through the modulus of the distance. And this is a scalar under rotations, okay? So here I have a complete symmetry under rotation, which is in mathematical terms an SO3 symmetry, okay? Remember your courses of quantum mechanics. So this term has an SO3 symmetry. Now, what happens when we go at distances such that we start to measure the dipole? Well, you remember that the dipole has an axial direction, right? As a, it's a, the dipole is a vector, as I wrote here. So there is a, a, select, a, a direction which is selected by the dipole. So this means that once we see not a point, but a vector, we are not able, we are not free to rotate this vector as we like. But the only way of keeping the physics invariant is to perform rotations around this vector, okay? In which this vector is considered, is make the axis of the rotation, okay? So rotations around the fixed axis are not SO3 rotations, but are unidimensional rotations. So the symmetry is smaller and it's SO2, okay? What happens when we go at the level of quadrupole? Well, you see that now the quadrupole selects two Direction, right? It is a, it is a two tensor, a rank two tensor. So we cannot rotate it anymore because otherwise we would change the physics. So at, at this level, we completely lose uh, any symmetry. So you see that one of the things that going at very long distances, or in the case of quantum field theory, very low energy buys us, uh, is the fact that we're going to have uh, symmetries. Okay. As we move to smaller and smaller distances or larger and larger energies, and we're gonna to have to consider more terms in our expansion, then these symmetries will be broken, right? And we can use, uh, we can try to measure the, the, the thing that we're doing, particle physics, or even here, we can try to measure the break of these symmetries and try to infer the properties of the next order term from the break of this, okay? So this was just uh, a cursory look, a cursory introduction about the 
theories. Of course, we're going to get back to this uh, many times in the future, and we're going to discuss it much better and put it on much further mathematical ground. Okay, so for the moment, this is all. So I thank you all for your attention, and uh, we see you soon. I see you soon uh, in the first lecture of the course. Bye.